Welcome everyone. This is the second event in an ongoing series for the Cuban Cultural Center where we are interviewing contemporary Cuban artists. And it is my pleasure and honor to be here with Maria Brito. Maria and I have worked together over many years. Maria, I don't even know how many years. Um, a few. <laughs> yeah, many. And so this is really a deep pleasure. And Maria, from my perspective, is one of the most important artists, Cuban artists outside of Cuba today. And so um, what I'd like to do is share some information about Maria, and then we'll pull up a PowerPoint that we put together, together, and then just kind of have a conversation about the work. And what I love about this is that Maria will have the opportunity to speak about her own work. And then I'll share some of some thoughts and insights into that work. But Maria was born in Havana, Cuba to a middle-class family, she tells me. She came to the United States when she was 13 with her brother and they were part of Operacion Pedro Pan, Operation Peter Pan. And Maria tells me my work is a means of communicating with others. It is the medium through which I explore my personal experience as I engage in a dialogue with the spectator, who by seeing my work can identify with its content through the recognition of similar events that have shaped their lives. My work deals with essential and universal existence as defined by emotions, sensations, knowledge, and perception. The imagery that I use is symbolic of a process of self-discovery. And as you'll hear, Maria will talk about the very intuitive nature of her work, and, and really in this sense, the spontaneous nature of her work. It is a personal iconographic system developed from my identity as a woman, a mother, an exiled Cuban, a naturalized American, and a Catholic. My work is an exploration of the intrinsically universal elements that each aspect of my being represents, these being gender, family, nation, ethnic identity, religion, and beyond religion the unexplained realities that lie beyond life in the certainty of death. Each piece develops gradually, usually initiated by a memory or a realization of a feeling that is linked to a particular event or a series of events. The search for the expression of this feeling in a tangible form leads me to the manipulation of objects forms and space that create the imagery which I hope results in the recre recreation of the original catalyst. And you'll see that Maria works in, in many mediums. Like the sculptures, they remain primarily autobiographical. And Maria has told me over the years that as you may gather from some of the pieces you're gonna see, that she is her own subject in the sense that she is her own model. So in that sense, the, much of the work is, is autodidactic, if you will. The autobiographical component is achieved in great part through the use of art historical references that evoke my personal state of mind, such as early Renaissance art. The theatricality a frozen action, the unreal perspective, and the confined spaces in the works, in my works, are part of my craft. Some of the most recent works also address social issues, as you will see, that relate to the dark side of human nature. And the idea, and I quote, that humankind itself has built into the structures of our societies and the cultures, the means of its own demise. And I'm going to share the screen with you in a, in a moment. So we will begin with this PowerPoint. And this first piece is an installation 
that Maria put together called Whitewash. And I will be talking with Maria a little bit about the piece um, and moving back and forth through some of the images because some of the details will give you a better idea of what this piece is about. And when I first looked at this piece, Maria, some, some of the things that, that jumped out at me as a viewer <laughs> with the suitcase, the suitcase, these framed images of clouds, this clock that seems to be frozen in time, at least in the image it does. <laughs> um, and of course, what we have in this confined space, you know, is, is this chicken wire, which suggests confinement. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit to this particular piece and how it embodies, I, I believe, some of your very fundamental themes in your artwork. Well, obviously it contains um, what supposedly was a being or is a being inside. Um, the, there's certain elements that imply uh, the ability to escape this structure, um, the, uh, the bag, uh, the red bag, uh, and um, the slightly open door. Um, but in the meantime, um, there are certain images that relate to religion. For instance, the chalice uh, in front of a um, in front of a, a mirror. Uh, which contains just uh, a, a pasted image of lips to imply a person, you know, looking at it. Um, in the background are skies, which again um, imply the idea of the open space. Uh, but everything is contained, and it's uh, it seems like a a prelude to what will happen eventually, uh, given the fact that the doors have opened. Yes, and I know that when we first talked about this image, Maria, when I saw the suitcase, I immediately was reminded of, you know, the condition of exile, of leaving mm -hmm. Cuba. You know, you leaving Cuba with your brother, and what then when we were speaking about this, <clears throat> you suggested to me that that it didn't have so much to do with that, that it actually was all of the kinds of um, structures and institutions and cultural mores that constrict and confine us, you know? Exactly, and, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and you, you mentioned religion and I was thinking in this particular detail, you know, the mirror is a reflection, not of the person, but of this idea, and of course, it's it's a somewhat sexualized image, you know, the red mm -hmm. lips that are painted, you know, and then of course you have this, you know, kind of very finished detail, and but then you have the clock with the wire hanging out, and you know, the idea that at the same time that you have this possibility of escape, the door is just open very narrowly. And, and we have, you know, what, what predominates um, or dominates this, this image is the, the chicken wire that holds you in. And I know this is another detail on the back that it's we- on, Actually on the outside, is a, uh, on the okay. outside of the piece, the outer side of the piece. Yeah, um, I would, wonder if you could speak to this, the idea of the tree and also the three, you know, examples of fruit. Right. Um, you know, when you're working on a piece of this, these dimensions, um, you ex obviously explore every single side of it. Um, and um, the tree of life, the fruit, um, everything is sort of very subtle, um, has subtle interpretations uh, to me. And the, the way I work is so intuitively that um, if I were to come up with a narrative about 
why I did this or that, it makes it very difficult. You know, it's, it, it's yeah. something done out of impulse or uh, intuition. I don't know if that- um, Are you ever inspired by dreams, Maria? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm inspired by feelings and uh, experiences, uh, whether past or present. And um, all of that informs my work, but it's not something that I think, and I'm gonna do this because of this. It's just, yeah. again, very intuitive, yeah. uh, the process is. Yeah, very organic, the process. And I know, you know, something you've just said um, makes me think of the idea that you, by, by creating a three-dimensional piece, you visually create the idea that there are many angles and perspectives to an issue. And I know that when we first talked about this particular detail, when I was looking at the tree, I was thinking simultaneously of the tree of knowledge, you know, and of course, <clears throat> the reference to, to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. Exactly and Eve being stigmatized as stealing knowledge, you know. Um, the other thing I was thinking of though too, looking at the tree is, the tree is a, is a very ancient symbol of humanity, you know, rooted in the earth, in the material world, but also aspiring toward the heavens. So, so I think that this, this particular detail resonates with, with some of the other aspects of this. In terms of the clock, is there anything you would add about the clock, Maria? Well, the clock is actually, uh, it actually works. So it, to a very still piece, a very still life piece, uh, so to speak, there's a, an element that is in, you know, it reflects the reality of the time elapsing, you know, as as you look at the piece. Yes. Um, I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. You know? <laughs> Total sense. And and just one last thing, you know, these images, in in some sense, um, what I was thinking is that on the one hand, they look like windows, as you were saying, that the the natural world is somehow outside beyond. At the same mm -hmm. time, nature is being literally framed and confined. And when I think about all that you've said about this piece, again, it speaks to me personally to the restrictions that are put upon us, particularly in the case of, of you know, gender, our gender roles and the expected behavior that comes with it. So at the same time that there are little windows onto the outside world, the free, suggesting nature, perhaps freedom, at uh -huh. the same time they suggest confinement, if that makes sense. Yes, because they're framed and they're, they're not open windows, they're just re reflections of what the being inside is yearning for, perhaps. Yes. And, and it's nature captured in painting. I always think of Magritte's, you know, this is not a pipe. Mm -hmm. that, that in a way you're, you're meditating on the connection between art and life, if you will. That's, that's part of what I see here. Anything else you would like to add about this particular installation? Um, I think you've covered it so well <laughs> that uh, it's, uh, it's a piece I'm proud of, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's a very beautiful piece. And when we were selecting the images together, um, I think that we both agreed it captures so many of your fundamental themes. And this is one of my favorite pieces. As you know, it's a three-dimensional piece that's behind you in mm -hmm. life um, titled Feed. And if folks look at it very closely in the intravenous bottle is actually a scene it reminded me of Frangelico's, you know, the expulsion from Eden. We have, um, you know, the tree of knowledge there. I know it's very close detail. 
and Adam and Eve, you know, who have this sense of shame, you know, when, when you know, that is, that is part of the story of the fall. And then you have this, I'm assuming a little girl, although the way we think about gender identity, you know, that's an assumption based on, on the way the figure is, is dressed in these traditional kind of almost like the velvet or patent leather shoes, mm -hmm. very, you know, formal dress, perhaps for a, a special occasion. And even though this, it, you know, the figure is, is supine, lying on this board, kind of hanging on the wall, it looks like they're, they're trying to curtsy because they are aware of the viewer. And so that's how this piece speaks to me. What it, do you think? It, yeah, it, it, it represents innocence. Um, and at the same time, this innocent being is fed all of these um, beliefs or, or uh, you know, the, the idea of sin and uh, spoiling, you know, in a way, the, the innocence of, of the being, of, of the girl in this case. Yes. Um, so she's being fed all of these ideas that uh, affect her um, purity. Absolutely. And I know, Maria, I mentioned to you that when I was interviewing different people for remembering Cuba, you know, my collection of testimonial expressions, many women commented to me who came to the US, um, some as a part of Operation Peter Pan, but others during the 60s and um, even into the early 70s that there was a kind of collision of the way that they had been raised in very traditional uh, Catholic in this case, or at least mm -hmm. in Cuban homes. And then of course, what was happening here in the US was the civil rights movement. And so many people commented on, again, this kind of collision between the way that they were raised and then what was happening in the US with, with white middle-class women at that point beginning to, to um, consolidate and close rank in the women's movement. And I wonder if that, if any of that had any bearing on, on you personally at the time that you came. I was very overprotected by my parents um, and information was somewhat limited. Uh, this particular piece has to do more with what I feel uh, young kids are uh, sort of brainwashed by certain beliefs, uh, religious beliefs, that, uh, you know, certain things are not right. And so therefore, um, there's the idea of uh, Adam and Eve uh, in, in the sins they, you know, that, that implies. Absolutely. Being fed into her, you know. Absolutely. And these next two pieces, and I'll go back and forth, again, emphasize this theme, I believe. You have these hands, which, which I, I, if I recall correctly, these are actually your hands, but it's, they're not gendered, these hands. And the idea of um, this figure, you know, covering herself with this, this somewhat, fem, you know, femi or feminist, you know, feminine, mm -hmm. she, you know, the, the idea of modesty and the, the symbol of cutting the hair. Um, when I show this image to my students, they, there's a kind of violence that they perceive here. And of course, hair being, a, a, again, a very ancient symbol of sexuality, of strength. And then in this piece, similar, you know, the fragmented, decapitated head, you know, that's constrained with and being fed something. And if you look at the, into these two jars, you know, these sealed jars with maybe formaldehyde or something, you see 
very traditional symbol of the finger, the finger of God, perhaps. Um, so I wonder if you could maybe comment about these two particular pieces and the way they connect to feed. Um, well, you, you were right in, in, you know, when you talked about what the cutting of the hair implies in this image right here. And if you go back to the other image, um, this being uh, of which we only see the head is being blessed, quote unquote, with um, this uh, liquid that appears to be a liquid sky. Uh, so it's um, sort of a forced um, imposition on onto the be the actual being, the actual makeup of the person. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. Yes, totally. And, yeah. And the title of this piece is blessed, and this piece is harvest. Um, so I see harvester. a lot of connections. Yeah, harvester. Yeah. Yeah, the harvester and a lot of connections. I wonder with this piece though, Maria, could you talk about what's behind the figure? Because it looks like a nest, but I'm not quite sure what that is. There's a, uh, a horizontal straight uh, piece of wood um, that is slightly below um, the right hand of the being, you know, it goes across the piece itself. Mm -hmm. And that implies um, the top, you know, the earth. Below that are roots. Above uh, that piece are very dry uh, pieces of vegetation. So it's, um, I guess it implies some sort of death or, mm -hmm. Um, and the image, the term, yeah, termination of something. Yeah, I'm thinking, listening to you, that that both death and life are embodied in this image with the roots. Um, so it brings that kind of complexity. And then I'm going to go to this next piece because we've talked a little bit about the autobiographical aspects of your piece, and this particular inst installation is titled Self-Portrait. And I wonder if you could share some thoughts with uh, We all piece. go through certain stages in life where um, life becomes kind of difficult. Uh, this figure is at the very end of a platform. Um, it's the, the flame symbolized change and well, destruction and change through destruction. Um, and that's basically it, it's a self-portrait. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and some of these, the elements, the particular elements, you know, of course, this image again of the cage, but the cage at the side of the head, you know, where, where intelligence, creativity, imagination resides, you have the <laughs> names so, yeah, some of the cage. flames, some of the flames are coming right through the bottom of that cage. Yes, which symbolizes the head. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. And I think you, you know, you talk about moments of change, and of course, the wheels suggest movement, perhaps even transformation, if you will. But at the same time, you know, I also see this idea of the phoenix. You know, that change comes in this with this kind of violence, with pain, you know, that where the sight of the heart is, is, you know, in flame. And then you have this very, you know, kind of hard covering of metal um, over the chest, kind of as a protection in some sense. Mm -hmm. So change coming in this way with the, with the hope of transformation, I'm thinking. Yes. And then this next piece I'm gonna move forward is called The Traveler. And we've talked about this before, Maria, and I know other people have. Lynette Bosch has written on your work and has talked about 
the Renaissance, per, you know, perspectives in your work is that, you know, I know you mentioned to me that you were very interested in Renaissance painting. And of course, during the Renaissance, this idea of three-dimensional perspective was introduced. And when I think of that metaphorically, this idea of, of moving from the present and then having this sense of not just escape because you're looking out the window. I mean, there is a portrait you know, on our left um, of a small child there. You have these two masks which may even suggest, you know, comedy, you know, and um, tragedy, if you will. Right, right. And then the figure with a kind of stigmata, if you will, the religious elements in here. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could speak yeah. to this. Yeah, the stigmata, by the way, um, the stigmata in Christ, you know, is redemption, the way I see it. Mm -hmm. uh, the stigmata on my hands in the in the painting uh, are the faces of my two sons. Mm -hmm. So that's my redemption, um, the way I saw it. Um, yeah. And uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, the piece is completely flat, but the way it's cut, the way it's um, well arranged, it implies depth of course, and this is where the Renaissance idea of space and um, those kinds of things uh, influenced my work. Yeah, absolutely. Then, yeah, and then the bucket and the base for the bucket are outside the plane of the, of the painting. Uh, and as you can see on the uh, left-hand side where the bucket is, there's a sky, a liquid sky sort of flowing over and uh, it looks like it's going to be collected in the bucket. Yeah, absolutely. And you also have some elements that, that we've seen in other works, the open door on our far left, mm -hmm. fact, the idea of confinement, um, the religious symbology, you know, there's this Eve figure, again, it's re reminiscent of Frangelico's Eve, and then of yes. course the shroud, if you will, and the resurrection, but this is a female savior. Um, also, the other elements I wanted to draw attention to, again, is this, this portrait of the, I'm assuming a young girl, young child, on our left as viewers. And then to the right, you have this very stormy sky outside, presumably a window. And then mm -hmm. you have these figures, you know, kind of in a haunting fashion around the head, almost like a halo. And then this tree that's stunted and bare. And to the far right, there's this, again, a fragment, the theme of fragmentation, the fragmented head, you know, and the wheel of thorns, if you will, on the bottom. Mm -hmm. But I right. wonder if you could comment on those elements. Uh, well, the, what is surrounding her head um, are demons uh, and they're taken from, I don't recall exactly the author, the, the painter, but they're taken from a Renaissance artist's paint, painting. Mm -hmm. um, and the, I guess they imply everything that is going on in this person's head. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the tree uh, also serves to uh, move the, uh, the eyes of the viewer towards the head uh, and everything that is happening. You know, so it's a matter of um, using elements to point to certain areas of the painting. Absolutely. Yeah, and again, it's, it's not the tree we saw on, you know, with your, your first installation. It's a tree that's been truncated 
just right. like the fragmentation in the head. And then this portrait, idealized portrait of the young girl. And because of the perspective of this piece, that may be a painting of a young girl, or we may be seeing into this depth of this painting, um, just like with the window we're seeing outside. So this idea of perspective, of, of different perspectives, of different angles is embedded in this work too. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, image, the image for the little girl I actually um, took from an old photograph of myself when I was about, I don't know, maybe four or five. Mm -hmm. So it's a self-portrait as a girl. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's a very idealized, you know, idea of a girl. And I think about Roland Barth talking about portraiture, about photography particularly, is that the meaning of the, of the photograph is really lies outside the parameters of the photograph and that, that we, we perform in a sense, we represent ourselves in the way we want to be remembered. And so in that respect, it's, it's a performance, but that this is, photography is a way of, of making our lives historically meaningful. So the photograph, you know, this portrait that is based on the photograph um, is just rich with possible meaning, I think. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Maria. No, I mean, you've done an amazing, I'm, I'm not very good when it comes to interpreting my own work. Um, it just, as, I, as you stated at, at the very beginning, you know, it's very intuitive in nature. And um, I work, I work in, in every, or I used to work in every single piece in such a way that the piece itself dictated to me what it needed. Yeah. Um, or, or implied to me what it needed. So um, I was sort of a conveyor of um, images that the piece required or asked of me. Uh, yes. I, I think, you know what I'm thinking of, Maria? I mean, first of all, you speak powerfully about your work. And, and as you know, I, I often see feminist themes in your work, even though I know you wouldn't characterize it that way. But when I'm listening to you now, your whole method or process is, is very important to speak about, I believe, because it reminds me of the difference between some artists, you know, plan their work, think their work out, research their work, and you are speaking about this very intuitive process that reminds me of Michelangelo's process that Michelangelo spoke of when, when he was presented with a stone, he didn't have a preconceived idea of what to do with the stone. He didn't impose himself on the stone. The stone told him what it needed to be. And in a way you're doing this with with, with the canvas and also with, with your three-dimensional installation work. Does that resonate for you? Well, it, it, um, it amazes me that uh, I didn't know about Michelangelo feeling that way about uh, the stones, but in, in, in a, you know, I hate to compare myself to Michelangelo or you, uh, but this is the process. This is the actual process, you know, searching for um, imagery that will complete the thought or the, the feeling that I want to convey. Absolutely. And, and consciously or unconsciously, you are in dialogue with other painters across time, as you've mentioned, the, the kind of influence of some of these painters. And I go to this piece next because the piece before, you know, that we just viewed, The Traveler, um, brings this theme of maternity and motherhood. And of course, in this piece, Madonna dethroned, again, you have some of the similar elements, the door that's open, you know, this nature, you know, at, at 
distance in the back and you know putting into to high relief this figure and these figures behind the madonna as being the idealization of motherhood but but the hands are are depicted in great detail and, and then of course you have on the our right the ladder going who knows where to nowhere into darkness yeah. so so could you talk to us and i wanted to also point out these two lights um you know at the bottom for me i see i saw immediately these breasts which again this idea of mother as nurturer so what is what were you, what are your thoughts as you're looking at this with me? All right. Well, let me start with the um, open door on the left hand side. Uh, that is part of a painting where there's a Madonna and child incorporated into the painting. So I just uh, reproduced the background without the Madonna. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's for that one area on the left of the image. Um, the, the two um, lamps, it's interesting you mentioned breasts. I thought of ovaries. Oh, wow. Oh, it, yeah, so it's right around uh, <laughs> along, the same, the, along the same line. Yes. Uh, and this, um, the centerpiece is actually, um, the black is a cutout, so the Madonna figure is uh, is 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 uh, in it's separated from the rest uh, of the of that one section in the middle. Uh, it's isolated. It's just held by the bottom section. Yes, um, and then um, the ladder. Uh, some of these elements uh, have to do with what I feel the piece may need um, it, without really thinking of the meaning of the piece, but also thinking of the meaning of the piece and, the, and something missing. So, so um, that's where the ladder came in. Plus, I wanted it to come off the wall uh, for whatever reason. Yes. And you, I'm thinking, just looking at this with you right now, Maria, be, behind you, of course, you have this black and white, you know, in the midst of, of these moments of, of color. Um, and again, the image of the tree, you know, suggesting life, but it's a bare mm -hmm. tree. And then all the crosses um, suggest not just suffering, and salvation, but death, you know? And when I look at the ladder, you know, this emptiness, you know, ascending, transformation, escape again through the doors, exactly. but into this darkness, into this void, into the unknown. So I think so, I see some of um, visually, you know, the, these elements that, that you incorporated into, to previous works. And again, this idealized vision of the mother and also the vision of the mother, the Madonna figure is the, you know, the, the asexual mother, you know, this is the paradox. The great paradox mm -hmm. is, is the, you know, the, the, you know, immaculate conception and things like that. And could you speak to the hands because everything is just in, in shadow or outline, almost like silhouette. <clears throat> right. The hands are have painted. these hands. Yeah, the hands are painted. And I, um, I guess I wanted to emphasize the caring of the, the Madonna figure for the child um, by making the hands uh, or the color of the hands more realistic as opposed to an outline or anything else. Yes. So it, it implies caring. Yeah, absolutely. And the last three images that we have, or actually, I'm sorry, I missed this one. Um, 
you know, is another manifestation of the Madonna figure. And again, you have these hands in this very traditional, you know, posturing. You have these cherubs surrounding this figure. And I mentioned to you, um, you know, they there's a kind of, you know, a resonance with Raphael's cherubs surrounding mm -hmm. the female figure. She dominates the canvas. And, but however, even though our our eyes are drawn to her face, to her, to her eyes, you have this mask hanging below. And the and the pattern on the mask, this checkerboard, is is echoed in in the garment that this female figure, I'm assuming female figure, um, yes. is wearing. So could you speak to us? All right, here you have a, um, a Madonna juggling uh, reality uh, in, in the sense of the house, uh, child, children uh, implied by the one child that is on the other, uh, sort of going on into the other hand, the right hand side, the right hand of the figure. Uh, so it's a juggling of... Uh, children, home, uh, responsibilities, uh, and um, there's a, an enigma uh, implied by the uh, mask. Um, so that's as far as I would go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, masking resonates with other themes about in respect to the, to the roles that we are socialized into acculturated you know in the in the in respect to women in particular again this idealized role of the uh, you know the the benevolent mother the mother who gives everything who's expected to be this kind of idealized figure and in when i was teaching victorian lit we talked a lot about this idea of the angel in the house you know, the, the idea that women were held up on a pedestal, but the reality was they were oppressed by, by so many of these expectations and mores. And so the mask conceals the true self, if you will. And of course the eyes that is see them through the mask as the mirror of the soul, if you will. Yeah. Very well put. <laughs> Anything else you would add before we look at the last few images. Um, I can't think of anything else. I think we covered quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. Unless, unless you have another question about the piece. Well, I think, uh, um, I think these last three images, and these are from your Goyescas, you know, inspired by the, the black paintings, the Pinturas Negras, which you, which you saw when you were in Spain. And, and mm -hmm. share a little bit about um, these series of paintings. Uh, they were basically a series of murals that Goya did living in this house. And then they were eventually moved, removed from the house, um, mm -hmm. you know, that had these very dark and disturbing themes. And I was doing some research on these particular pieces. I've seen them myself. Um, you know, and they portray these very intense, haunting, you know, ideas, if you will, that human beings struggle with, you know, fear in this case um, of insanity when Goya was creating these pieces, and also the idea of facing death in this particular piece. Um, you titled this, and of course, this is a piece, maybe you could talk to us about the process, a sculpture of, of what will he die? And then the following pieces, again, you know, this is a very dark piece where you have these three crones, and of course, these, you know, almost like the three witches of Macbeth, the three mm -hmm. fairies, and these children who are bound, um, and then the last piece that we have here is the sleep 
of reason produces monsters, which reminds me of the, you know, some of your earlier pieces, the traveler with these monsters, demons haunting the female figure. So I wonder if you could speak to this series and the, your own process working with clay and these themes that again, we see throughout your work. Um, yes, I, I was seen, I was very fortunate to be able to travel to Spain and I saw a lot of uh, Goya's work uh, in, in the flesh, not in books. And I was really um, taken by by his work, um, and this particular piece, I, I like. I love the irony of many of his pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, there's an, um, I guess you can say, an ass mm -hmm. taking care of a person who is very ill. Um, so there's Goya saying, "Of what will he die? Um, not necessarily his ailment, but maybe the." the poor care, I don't know. Um, the, um, the material I used was a um, polymer clay, which can be um, baked in the oven, actually in an oven, in a regular oven. So um, I didn't have to fire the pieces in a kiln. Um, and um, I made a a whole series of these uh, Goyescas. I enjoyed the process, I enjoyed the building, uh, and I enjoyed the irony that was behind most of them. Yes, and you know, when I look at this piece in particular, you know, Goya was looking at the dark side of human nature, if you will. Yes. And yeah. very bleak. And of course, this piece is the antithesis you know, of the idealized feminine, the idealized mother figure, et cetera, et cetera. And then of course this piece is all these questions that haunt human beings, deeply philosophical. Um, any other thoughts? I mean, I'm wondering if you could comment on this piece. It's a very dark piece. Um, well, these older ladies, uh, doing the weaving or whatever it is that they're doing, but um, the image of the children uh, attached onto a pole uh, implies a lot of dark uh, interpretations. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, Absolutely. Again, I hate to think of what. Yes. Um, and um, this, I, this was the last, piece I did uh, of, of the series. I, I actually showed them all in a show um, at a local gallery. Um, and um, this was the last piece that I completed. Uh, the El Sueño, no, what is it? Uh, the Sleep of- The Sleep of Reason. The Reason for the monsters. monsters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah beautiful. I'm so going to take our love the imagery, the imagery and the you know whatever is implied in it. It's fascinating. Absolutely. I'm going to take our PowerPoint down, and in the time we have left, Maria, um, I'd like to just ask you a couple questions. You know, one question, as you know, I love to ask is, you know, what did I not ask you about your work that, that is important for us to know. And then the other question, I know that you, you are not producing any art at this point. And I'd like to talk to you about that because I think it's, it's an amazing thing that you are not driven by any market or any imperative to keep producing art that that in this moment and perhaps in the future, you may have said visually what you need to say. So I'd like to talk to you about that. And then the final question will have to do with 
is Cuba in your work? Where is Cuba if it's there at all? So the first question is just the open question. What have I not asked you that I missed in your work? Well, I think you know my work. Uh, I interpret my work and we've talked a lot about my work. So everything that you help me, um, help me convey, uh, because I'm not very good with words, uh, it's right on, you know, right on target. Um, as far as uh, not my, my not producing any more work, uh, it was a, it wasn't as painful as I thought it would be because I, uh, I'm not going to produce something that doesn't come from inside me, come from my gut, from my everything. Uh, and so that is dry for now. Mm -hmm. And I think it will remain that way. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm okay with it and I'm happy. And I'm, you know, I feel privileged to have been able to work for so many years uh, in a, what used to be my garage in the house. I turned it into a studio uh, and that's where I worked. Um, and the other question was? The other question is about Cuba is, to what degree do, do you think that the trauma you experienced as a, a family, and of course we experienced, you know, as a nation, mm -hmm. um, being displaced, you came here with your brother, and even though I know that you eventually ended up, um, you know, in a very loving home, there is that trauma of the loss of a nation because, um, you know, that we've all experienced. And, and I also wonder, so to what degree does that inform your work, if it does? And the other question is, are there elements in your work that are, that are identifiably Cuban, do you believe, or no? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's an issue um, that obviously affected me in whichever way, I don't know. Um, or maybe, I, I just don't know, uh, obviously for a 13 year old and her younger brother to come to a place um, without their parents. I mean, we always traveled with my parents and we did everything with my parents. Um, and all of a sudden find yourself by yourself with your brother and what do, what do we do? But fortunately we were able to um, be rescued, so to speak, from, by the Cabreras, a family that was um, uh, God sent and uh, took care of us until our parents came. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they were they were friends of my dad, so I'm my, I'm my parents. And that that moment at 13 is a moment of transformation of change. Mm -hmm. young girl um, and it's hard not to think that some of these themes you know surfaced for you in terms of that moment of change which was compounded by the trauma of being separated of leaving a country I believe you've never returned to Cuba is that correct no, never yeah yeah, and as a child, you know, I think of so many times talking to my mom about this, you know, um, the idea, I mean, the idea of a 13-year-old a girl at this moment of transformation on the threshold of womanhood also having this compounded by this loss and this trauma, and how do you even process it as a child? let alone as an adult, not even knowing what the long-term ramifications are. And, you know, in some sense, I can see you struggling with some of these, these ideas and these themes in the work in a way. Um, the, other, the other question that you commented on, it really is quite extraordinary. I mean, when we think about the production of art and culture, particularly in the United States and the imperative to keep, you know, to, to, you know, to keep producing work 
and to have this coherent vision of the work and being driven by the market and you have completely resisted what is really a very materialistic, if you will, um, you know, commodification of art. And you have just absolutely resisted that because your work is intuitive and creative and organic and spontaneous in this way. So it's a very extraordinary thing, I believe, for an artist. Um, to say I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, no, really, really, yeah. the moment yeah. of, of, of being true to yourself and knowing that I finished, I basically I've said what I need to say. It's amazing. Well, you are amazingly articulate about your work. I don't agree with you. Um, <laughs> that you well, <laughs> <it's> <laughs> yeah, and I, this has been an incredible honor, Maria. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And I thank you for featuring the work. Thank you so much again, Maria. This was just an honor.